I'm Kim Knox, president of the League of Women Voters of San Diego, and I'd like to welcome you all here today. I want to give a big thank you to those that made who, who made a donation when you signed up. We are a nonprofit organization and we're entirely volunteer run. So if you feel inclined to make a donation, we accept cash and checks here at the registration table and credit cards on our website. Um, I we do like to acknowledge elected officials. So if anyone who is attending is an elected official would you, and would like to be acknowledged, feel free to raise your hand. Okay. Um, as far as our upcoming events, we are taking in a bit of a break in December, but we'll be back in January with Sips and Civility on Voting Rights and Voter Suppression. That's January 13. As you know, we usually get together on a, Tuesday, or sorry, a Thursday evening at 5.30 p.m., so that's the second Thursday. And then our Wednesday daytime event is on the fourth Wednesday, and that will be on the topic of the Supreme Court and controversial decisions. And coming up in February on the 10th, what is the rescheduled date for our event on teaching about diversity and the controversy over critical race theory. Our event today is being videotaped and will be available on YouTube tomorrow. So if you do have your phone with you, if you could please silence it. And um, so that way you can share that event with your friends or rewatch it. Um, now I'd like to invite Jane Andrews, our program chair up to tell us about our speakers today. Greetings, everybody. It's, it's great to see you all. We have two excellent speakers whom I will introduce. And then we also have our own Beryl Flong. Beryl? <laughs> Who, as most of you know, is the, the amazing chair of our Immigration and Deportation Committee and who's been a remarkable leader on immigration. Um, and she's going to do part of the presentation and the Q&A, and I'm going to do a little bit too because I'm a member of her committee. Um, let me first introduce Troy Elder here. Troy is an immigration lawyer, a community organizer, and a former law professor with over 25 years of legal experience. He taught most recently at Yale, from which he holds graduate degrees in law and in ethics. He currently serves as the Migration Missioner at the Episcopal Diocese of San Diego, and he will talk to us primarily about legal issues around asylum, the migration policy protocols, Title 42, that, that angle on things. And Jason Berkovich, just to my right, uh, your left, has worked for Congressman Scott Peters for over eight years. And he is in the San Diego office. He is the Director of Constituent Services and Foreign Policy, and Foreign Policy Advisor to Congressman Peters. And he's going to give us some up-to-date information on the political issues and factors during the, the past year and going forward. And he also just told me before we got started that he was a financial advisor prior to that. So, um, To set the stage for our discussion, I'm going to begin with some slides, which is, are some of which are from a presentation that Beryl and I gave this past June at the League of Women Voters of California convention. And we also have added some new data and some ideas about migration management. So I start with this picture because for me this is sort of an iconic one around what this year has been about for uh, so many people. I think there was a lot of hope with Biden coming in, a lot of eagerness of people who've been waiting many years for change. So that's where we start. So I'm going to do a couple of really quick slides on sort of immigration 101 because it's such a complex topic and I think it's useful to get the rundown. So this is a list of ways to come in and although Many on the right say the borders are open. They actually are not. And there, is, there are only certain ways you can get in. And one of the things about all these ways is that with different administrations, the numbers go up or go down. And as one immigration attorney said at one of our committee meetings, it's whiplash. And I think from one administration to the other. But let me just give you the rundown. There's the temporary visa, the work travel student that I'm sure you know about 
There are different varieties of guest workers. There's the H1A. H1B is people with special skills, often technology. There's H2B, which is seasonal workers, and that was increased significantly in 2021, both for agriculture as well as the hospitality industry. So next on the list is, I've put a green card, which requires family or an employer sponsorship. There is, as you may have heard in the news, a special immigration visa, SIV, which is being used currently for Afghan refugees, and this is when you have given a particular service to the United States. And then there is the EB-5 visa, and if you invest 1.8 million in US business, you too can get a green card. <laughs> so there's a lot of ways. And then of course there is the claim of asylum, you need to have proof of credible fear, and then refugee status, which we'll talk about a little more. So the next is the federal agencies involved, and I have to admit, I have trouble understanding this, but there are three main ones. And one of the reasons, one of the things that's important about this is that with different administrations, you get different administrative law and decisions. So again, the whiplash around things. So first off, there's Department of Homeland Security. We now have Alex Mayorkas. That's where Citizenship and Immigration Services is. It's where the custom, they oversee the Customs and Border Patrol and they also oversee ICE, which is interior enforcement. Then you have the Department of Justice, and with Merrick Garland in, that has also made some changes. So there's the Executive Office for Immigration Review, which runs the courts, and the Board of Immigration Appeals. I suspect Troy knows something about this terrain and can speak to us. And then finally, there's the Department of Health and Human Services, which has been key in the resettlement and care of unaccompanied children. Okay, so on to the Biden presidency. Lots of hope. Uh, for many people, there's a real hope that we would get some expanded citizenship, even for just a few people. There are many groups who have been mobilizing, especially late spring, summer. The ones that I've noted, all the usual ones, but I addition additionally have noted the We Are Home Coalition, very active on the East Coast, very young, progressive group, America's Voice, and then there is also an American Business Immigration Coalition. Um, because I, there are many businesses that, as you know, are seeking workers. So I'm gonna say a word, we're focusing primarily on the national issues, because one of the things Beryl and I have realized is that, you know, you, you can't, the, the, Washington is really where such important things happen. There's a lot we do in California, a lot we do locally, but national legislation is, you know, really the goalpost. So initially, Biden put forward a comprehensive plan, the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021 with the eight-year path to citizenship. And I think like many of his approaches, it was, you know, kind of, this is, this is the ideal. But then um, many people began working on more incremental steps. And there were three ones that, that uh, were particularly noteworthy, two of which did pass the House, but couldn't get enough support in the Senate. And one was the Dream and Promise Act, which is the DACA recipients. If you have questions about that, we can talk to that. But that had nine Republican votes. And then there was the Farm Worker Modernization Act, which was a very carefully worked out proposal to provide a path to citizenship for farm workers and also uh, expand guest workers. And that passed the House with 34 Republicans' votes. And I think some of that speaks to the heartland where there's a need for more, more workers. And then the final one is Senator, our Senator Padilla's pathway to citizenship for essential workers. And given the role that essential workers have played during COVID, it seemed like it was time to recognize them. So none of those came to fruition. There was an attempt to include all three of those components in the budget reconciliation bill, but the parliamentarian ruled it out, wasn't considered to be budget. However, and again, Jason will tell us more about this, I hope, there still is an effort to get at least some expanded citizenship for people who already hold visas. There's a huge wait list for people who have visas and can't get in. 
So this is a poll. I attended a webinar last week by the Bipartisan Policy uh, Center in DC on immigration, and they have very interesting presentations from both sides. And this is a poll that was presented, uh, and it was done in early November by the National Republican Congressional Committee. And it's a little bit disturbing, but I think it's realistic, and I think it says a lot about how Republican candidates are likely to play their cards leading up to 2022. So 59% of voters oppose granting amnesty to illegal Im immigrants, including 70% of independents. And I think the independents, you know, it's the swing vote that everybody's looking for. 56% uh, of voters, including 63% independents, oppose providing legal status work permits, federal benefits, to millions of foreign nationals who illegally cross the southern border. That was the wording of the poll. And then 54%, 59% of independents oppose removing federal limits on the amount of immigration authorized each year. So that's a, a, a useful poll. So I'm gonna, I have a few slides. Um, I'm going to go through very quickly. This, uh, many of them are from uh, the Border Patrol. And I think this one, as you can see, the blue lines are all nationalities, and it turns green when we get to 2,000. I, I realize it's probably hard to read, but at 2,000 we get green. And all the green are Mexican um, migrant encounters, and then the black are non-Mexican. And I think, obviously, the big uptick in 2021 you've heard about in the news, so um, we can come back to this if we want. And then this one is somewhat similar, but it starts in 2019. And the blue section is the Mexican, Mexican encounters. And then the green, the brown, and the yellow, I mean the red, are the Northern Triangle, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. But then you see this huge new addition starting in April of 21, which is other countries. And there's been many people on our border from Somalia, certainly Haiti, of course. Um, and um, so it's, it's become much broader. Um, and Troy and Jason, if you have comments you want to inject, just jump right in. This is a slide that shows all the Title IV expulsions and regular apprehension. So the blue are the people who have been apprehended but are sent immediately back to Mexico without hello, who are you, fingerprints, you name it. And then the green are uh, people who have been apprehended but not sent back. They may be on a list for an asylum process. They may, be, they may have been part of a humanitarian move because there was quite a lot of movement towards a humanitarian. But you can see it goes, so before the, the big leap up in March of 21, most people were expelled, sort of in the 80s and 90s, and then it's been a lower number in recent months. So I'm gonna just say a word about refugees, because this was uh, confusing to me. So there's, refugees are a separate track from asylum seekers. They're done through a process that is mandated by the UN High Commission. There's Homeland Security checks. There's a domestic resettlement process. It's, a, it's just a whole other track from asylum at the moment. So again, in, during Trump, it, there were very low numbers. And then Biden has brought it up significantly. Uh, but it's a drastic reduction from the past. And there's so many people waiting internationally. And I just have a slide that shows this is from a high point in the 80s to a low point in 2020. It doesn't show. And then there's also, there's the ceiling and then how many are actually admitted. So a word about the situation on the border, um, and Beryl will say more about it, but as I'm sure you know, the humanitarian crisis is severe. This is a photo from the El Chaparral uh, entry point in San Isidro, where there's Thousands, 2,000 or so people camped out in tents. Shelters are overwhelmed. Most are seeking asylum and just waiting for appointments. Um, there are many deported migrants living in Tijuana. 
increased sea arrests and recent deaths at sea, which again have been in the news. And then this is a photo. So we had a tour, which Beryl organized in, at the end of September. And this is a photo that I took that, that for me captured the, the waiting and the desperation. This is in one of the shelters, which was indoors, but it was lined with tents, totally crowded. There are two doors on the back, which are the bathrooms, and there's a structure on the right, which is the shower. And people were afraid to go outside, so everyone was just waiting. So uh, just a word about the wall. It's um, during Trump. Um, there were 350 miles replaced or reinforced and 50 new miles built. And then when Biden came in, there was an immediate halt to wall construction, more emphasis on electronic surveillance. And we have a couple of slides. Uh, and I think the one on the lower shows where the old wall was and then the new wall. And that was down right um, you know, near Friendship Park. Uh, and I think the other pictures you all probably know pretty well. Um, so I want to just say a couple of things about an article that Beryl and I thought was very interesting about approaches to migration management and border security. And this is for, for the Migration Policy Institute. And it's written by Alan Burson, who's a, a past chief Homeland Security officer. So, and again, a lot of this you know, but I think it's in trying to formulate policy it's important to see how migration patterns have shifted. So one is that it's on the rise nationally, and I think we see that now in Poland, Belarus. Migrant flows mobilize quickly, can be nonstop, and they don't respond to the usual deterrence. So, you know, the Haitian group coming our way, it, it's, uh, there's sort of these flows. There's a big role of smugglers and smuggling organizations. Um, information by cell and online communication helps both those who are migrants on the road, but also smugglers, uh, and that no single government can really effectively counter mass migration. And it's interesting, because you do see that in Europe as well, as it's not just us. So he recommends a regional asylum system, merging the refugee and asylum application and processing so recommends that it's offshore, or at least not on our borders, in order to minimize the role of smugglers, confronting migrants, being prepared for humanitarian crises at the border, as we were not this spring, and then, as always, expanding options for legal migration. So, Beryl, I'm going to have you come around, come this way. Fine. I'm Beryl Flom. I chair the Immigration and Deportation Committee for the League in San Diego. Uh, we meet monthly on the second Thursday at 9 a.m. We've been meeting by Zoom. But I'm wearing my great outfit today because uh, I'm very excited uh, and hope that you notice that Robert Vivar uh, crossed the border on the 11th, on Veterans Day. Uh, he's been deported for many years, and he chairs the United U.S. Deported Veterans Group in Tijuana. Um, and he himself is not a veteran, but he's helped them a lot. He has, you know, about 100 people he's helping out. Um, and he came to our meetings every month and gave us an update on his work plus what was going on in Tijuana. And every time we go down to Tijuana, he's right there with a bus to pick us up, and he's just been terrific. So we're very excited to have Robert back on the U.S. side of the border and uh, back with his family. Um, which reminds me, uh, KPBS yesterday did a wonderful show called Voces, American Exile Deported Vets. If you can pick it up, you know, when they repeat it, it's well worth watching. Incredible stories about um, veterans who've been deported for the most uh, unreasonable and uh, almost, you know, unexcusable uh, 
infractions, things like DUI or jaywalking or uh, not filling in the form right or something like that. Um, so there are hundreds of them overseas and we're working hard to get them back into the U.S., back home. Uh, these are people who were not citizens when they joined the military and uh, the military was supposed to give them citizenship but somehow it didn't happen. And so if, if U.S. citizens uh, did these uh, misdemeanors, why they would not be punished at all. So it's really unfair the way it is. Um, okay, so we also work on immigration mainly. We meet with members of Congress. Um, we meet, uh, we usually have a speaker every month uh, from some organization that's working on immigration. And uh, we, we do uh, trips or um, service activities down in Tijuana. Uh, the next thing I'm planning is a trip to the Ote Mesa Detention Center, but I've got to get their permission first. I haven't started it, so. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, after reading uh, what Troy sent us, that we ought to have sort of little meet and greets around the, the county, around the league, uh, to talk about immigration. And I'll get some of my committee members to come join me and, and we'll answer questions and talk about what's going on in the news. So uh, it's important to share what you've learned with your friends and, and family and uh, and so we want to do more of that um, as we continue to educate our members and the public. Anyway, great to have you here, and thanks so much. Marilyn, you to say something about the California? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so after the state convention <coughs> last summer, um, we, there were people from around the state that wanted to follow up the caucus we did there uh, by having a group statewide. So we started that. Uh, our next meeting is, well, our meetings are normally the fourth Thursday at one o'clock, but because that's Thanksgiving, uh, we're gonna meet this Saturday at one o'clock. And um, we are proposing to send a, a letter to all the leagues in the country asking at program planning if they could uh, request that the National League put more of their efforts into advocating for immigration and the bills that are coming through. Um, the League's influence is important and we think it's time that they concentrate on immigration a little more. So that's, that's our project. Um, and uh, anybody who wants to join either committee please let me know, and uh, we'd love to have you. Thanks a lot. Well, great to be here, um, and thanks for the nice introduction and, and amazing uh, rocket speed uh, trip through immigration law and policy. I'm very impressed, Jane. <laughs> I think you maybe were a, an immigration professor in a prior life or something. We have to get to the bottom of this. Where to start? I was, um, I lived near Palm Springs and was driving down here this morning. And as I got onto the 10, as you may know, there's a couple ways to go. The quick ways, the freeways. Then there's the mountain route kind of out of the way. And GPS kept saying, I'm gonna get, take you through the mountains. And I'm like, no, let's, I'm gonna be late and all this kind of stuff. I decided to override the GPS and kind of go west on the 10 anyway. And of course, that was wrong. That was a bad idea <laughs> because I was, stranded for a while, thinking, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get here in time for, I was gonna get here plenty early, have a little lunch, move in, you know, kind of get settled, and I just got here in time. I felt stranded, I felt marooned, I felt stuck, I felt trapped. And I thought that might be a good metaphor for some of what's going on at the border. And what I'd like to share in the few minutes that I'm gonna talk 
uh, and then through your questions is uh, what I'd like to say is sort of the human side of what's happening at our border, at our southern border, just a few miles south of here. And um, we'll really just kind of scratch on a little bit of, of uh, the, the range of topics that are critical to, to immigration um, and immigrants in this country that, that Jane put up there. But that has to do with the humanitarian pathways uh, to access this country, which um, for much of our history have been enshrined in treaties and in our constitution, but have been chiseled away at uh, a lot in recent years. So. Um, I'm a lawyer by training, and I work for a church now, so I just thought I might tell you what that's all about. Uh, I'm thrilled to work with the Episcopal Diocese of San Diego, which stretches from Friendship Park to Yuma, Arizona, and up to and including the Coachella Valley, where I live. I've also lived down here in San Diego uh, doing border work. And it is an interesting time uh, having a humanitarian crisis so close to the borders of the United States. I've been doing this work for 20 years. Started working in Miami with Haitian, what we called back then, boat people, not the best term, right? So it was a different type of border, a sea border. And if you had told me actually 20 years later I was going to be seeing Haitians in San Diego, I would have been, you're crazy. There's not a single Haitian actually in California. The border is palpable. The border is close. The border is problematic. The border is nurturing. It's a source of economic growth and resources for this region. It's a source of incredible pain for so many. And fear and legitimate concerns. And it's a very difficult moment that uh, in my denomination and as advocates, people of faith and people of conscience um, other, and, and others uh, of conscience are trying, to, are trying to meet this moment. And um, so I'm thrilled to be here. The legal part that I was asked to talk about uh, was a, uh, I'll just kind of skim over some of the, the parts we've left behind. The last administration had systematically through a series of programs with weird acronyms that I won't bore you with, except the ones that are still plaguing us, um, had effectively ended asylum at the southern border um, through a combination of procedural hurdles, physical hurdles, and not just the wall, and then substantive law hurdles within the doctrinal corpus, if you will, of, of asylum law. It was a perfect storm, and I'm not gonna be political here, but uh, Stephen Miller and the last administration were very effective. It was one of the most effective parts of, of the last administration, was dismantling uh, a system based on international law, which the United States had always been a champion of. Um, the right to seek to knock at the door to seek asylum is one that since at least before the Cold War in the wake of the Holocaust and World War II has been, <clears throat> has been recognized by all civilized nations as it's just a part of what it means to be a civilized society. When someone reaches your shores and says, I'm being persecuted in my country of origin. It's a very narrow actually category though it seems like there's so many asylum seekers and there are a lot right now at the southern border. To be an asylum, to successfully uh, win your asylum case, you need to show that you've either been subjected to harm uh, in the past, severe harm, uh, or you have a well-founded fear of future persecution, but not just based on anything. Uh, it's based on a, a relatively narrow set of five criteria, five categories, basically. Race, religion, political opinion, Membership in a social group, which has included LGBTQ folks, has included, included tribes, it has included, depending on which part of the world uh, you're from, and the fifth one uh, is nationality. That's actually a pretty hard test. Nationwide, only about 25% of asylum cases succeed, and that varies dramatically depending on whether you're detained in, a, in an immigrant prison, like we um, have been tending to do, sadly, for 30 years here. Uh, asylum seekers, or whether you're on the outside and you have a lawyer, and of course it depends on where you're from and, and the circumstances, and, and it depends on the current uh, status of things in Washington. What is happening right now, a few miles south of here, in, as we saw with the photos of the encampment at Chaparral, and uh, as uh, two hours east of here in, um, in, in Mexicali, and, and all along the border, is uh, what I would say is the remnants of um, 
a couple of, of policies that were, as I said, quite effective in, on, under the last administration. Uh, the first is, as Jane referenced, is Title 42. What is Title 42? Title 42 is a part of the public health code that for the first time, I believe, or one of the first times in modern history has been what I'll call uh, weaponized in a way to, to serve immigration purposes. And um, it was raised as in March of 2020, as you probably all remember, the advent of COVID and the border closure. Um, but it quickly turned out that the border closure was in fact not really a border closure for everyone. <laughs> If you had business going back and forth across the port of San Isidro, the, the port of entry at San Isidro, um, if you had uh, a U.S. passport, if you had a number of qualifying reasons to get you back and forth across, the border was never really closed. So in effect, it was closed only to people seeking asylum. Of course, we know that the virus doesn't discriminate. And so hundreds of tens of thousands of border crossings back and forth here at the largest port of entry in the Western Hemisphere, the largest land border crossing in the Western Hemisphere, uh, dwarfed the number, the relatively tiny number at that time of asylum seekers who were trying to um, legally do what the law says you should legally do, which is come to a port of entry and, and seek international protection. Uh, Title 42 um, effectively is a, a sort of wall a sort of wall that is uh, staffed by the Border Patrol, which performs a very important function. Don't get me wrong, my next door neighbor is a Border Patrol agent, and we have lots of conversations about the interdiction of drugs, and, and uh, so I, I certainly recognize a legitimate role for, for Border Patrol. But Border Patrol and Customs and Border Protection, which are part of Department of Homeland Security, an agency created in 2003 in the wake of 9-11, um, is in effect um, has erected a sort of barrier that pushes back asylum seekers who either try to cross or as they're supposed to at a port of entry or increasingly desperate in between ports of entry. And what that means, earlier Jane had a slide that showed the difference between expulsions and apprehensions. Well expulsions are, are just that. There's really no contact that the person, the the, the, the person seeking help is allowed to make with the U.S. immigration system. So there's no record of that person, and there are multiple, I, I hate to use this word, recid recidivist, mostly because I can't pronounce it, but it reminds me too much of, of sort of the criminal context. But there's a lot of, when you see those hundreds of thousands of numbers, that's not that many people. It's a lot of people are continuing to try and try and try, because unlike apprehensions, the other category she featured, Apprehensions, uh, which sounds kind of scary and like the person has done something wrong, is basically our government's term for, oh, they did things the right way, which means that now they have a chance to argue their case for asylum. Now, that means in many cases, under the last administration, they, that, that an adult, um, and that, as you saw, families were sometimes, or often, detained in immigrant prisons in this country and families were pulled apart. Um, in recent months since the advent of, of since, the, um, since the, Biden, <clears throat> the Biden administration took over, we'd seen a lot more with respect to the apprehensions of um, once the person's data is taken and once they've had their, uh, their initial interview getting across um, and they're, they're released to go live with families all around the country and then proceed through the deportation process, if you will, the asylum process legally uh, those are apprehensions. That's sort of how the system is supposed to work in, in a certain sense. So what we've seen with the Title 42 is it's kind of working at cross purposes, I think, even for those who argue ostensibly Title 42 is about public health. It is creating more return seekers, if you will, who've had no contact with our immigration system and so are, in a sense, not deterred you know, in the way that they might be if they were actually apprehended and had a case that got going, because there's consequences if you lose your, if you lose your case and come back later, right? Okay, so hopefully that wasn't too convoluted. But so the expulsions piece is really kind of a, I think, a, a scary sort of number that is um, inflated in, by the circumstances and is working somewhat at odds with the purposes um, for which the program is, is touted. 
This summer, working in, um, in Mexicali at a shelter, and by shelter, I mean something like you saw in, um, I think that was Beryl's slide, or I forget, one of your guys' amazing slides in Tijuana, um, basically a two-story motel with 10 rooms on top, 10 rooms in the bottom. Um, there were 230 families from Central America in those 20 rooms, so two families or more per room, each family on a mattress. Um, who were in, who, who are still actually in the shelter in Mexicali that our that my, my denomination works with? Um, the government actually opened up a tiny window in the Title Forty Two barrier, and that was th there were three categories: folks with severe medical conditions. Um, we had a little girl with cerebral palsy. We had a lot of you know folks with, mostly with kids with those conditions. Um, folks who were in vulnerable categories like LGBTQ migrants, um, black migrants in some cases, uh, because these are groups that are specifically targeted even within the migrant uh, groups that approach the border, caravans and such. And then third was families with very young children. So there was an exemption process, a humanitarian little window to get through and around, if you will, um, and we were able to, we and I, when I say we, um, some volunteer, a lot of vol volunteer lawyers and pro bono lawyers in Tijuana and a couple in Mexicali were able to put forward names and take clients to the border and explain, look, please let this person in just to start the process because look at this girl with cerebral palsy or look at this. That came to a halt in August. Um, uh, my colleague here may have <laughs> more skinny on why that happened. Uh, in, in part, it happened because the ACLU that had been suing the government, saying this is against our treaty obligations, this is against international law, this is against our constitution. Uh, settlement negotiations between the ACLU lawyers and the, and the Biden administration uh, fell through. So that, even that narrow window was closed and remains closed right now. So effectively, if you are an asylum seeker attempting to frankly, exercise the rights that international law and constitutional law in this, in this, in this country provide you, uh, you're, you're out of luck and you are stranded. You are stranded along the border. Um, I'll stop there and certainly can answer more questions about that uh, in the Q&A. The second policy that you, I think you heard alluded to is called somewhat euphemistically in, in an Orwellian way, I think, uh, the Migrant Protection Protocols, MPP, also known as the Remain in Mexico policy. That is a policy that uh, under the last administration, stranded, marooned, basically compelled people who had been apprehended by going to a port of entry and trying to begin the asylum process, forced them to remain in Mexico all along our border and depending on where you were along the border, that could have been in a makeshift camp in a rural area in Texas. It could have been in, in more urban areas like Tijuana and Mexicali. It could have been in, in what we would call sort of decrepit motels and quasi shelters that are just struggling to, um, to, to get by, but in some of the da most dangerous border cities in the hemisphere. So folks who'd been seeking relief from persecution in their own countries found themselves stuck for six months, a year, a year and a half, two years. I, I used to represent uh, folks, mostly from Central America, who were enrolled, again, euphemistically, enrolled in the migrant, pers we, we somewhat cheekily called it the migrant persecution pr protocols, who were enrolled in this program. And what did that mean? They were, every couple of months, were required to show up at the port of entry and they were bused to an immigration judge in San Diego and then bused back. Um, huge expenditure of resources, huge uh, annoyance to most of the uh, immigration judges in San Diego who didn't want anything to do with this program, or outraged with it, but they had to. And most problematically, hugely, not just inconvenient for, but you might think, oh, well, other side of the border, that's good to stay, you know, get a, get a motel room in Mexicali. Well, sadly, a lot of the Central Americans actually, the gang networks and cartels and criminal uh, organizations that persecuted them in their home countries are international and often followed them up to the border and followed them hanging out, hanging out outside of shelters. I had a number of usually young women with 
toddlers tell me I'm actually getting death threats, and they would show me I'm getting death threats from this guy who was part of a gang who burned down my house in Guatemala. And it's just, it's just for me, unthinkable that, and, and for I think most, I would hope most people of conscience, to think that stranding somebody in another dangerous country for a year and a half to two years while they try to fight their asylum case, usually without a lawyer and without much money, how that is in some way protecting them, um, you got me. President Biden tried to undo or turn off or get rid of the MPP program, and it was one of his campaign promises, and he did that shortly after. He took office, uh, but he was sued by uh, some folks in the state of Texas who argued uh, that the MPP program was ended kind of on a procedural technicality, didn't go through all the bells and whistles that the Congress, that the President should have done. And federal courts in Texas have basically required Biden to restart the MPP program. And he, through Secretary Mayorkas, is pushing back. Maybe our, again, my friend here will give us some, some insider stuff on that. Um, but MPP is slated to be up and running again. They're rebuilding the tent, the tent cities and the tent courts in Brownsville, Texas. It is, it is back. So these two policies continue to be a huge stain on our Constitution, if you ask me, but a huge block of, uh, of, of legal and practical um, uh, obstacles that migrants, largely poor, largely from Latin America, mostly from three countries, um, are, trying to, are trying to overcome. Fortunately, I want to give you a little good news. <laughs> I had said at the beginning of this that the, um, it was not just these procedures at the border, but also the substantive law of asylum was uh, hardened in a way that it made it impossible for folks who had actually come across and approached the land border at our southern border to seek asylum. Uh, President Trump eliminated the possibility of asylum for anybody who crossed over um, a country like Mexico, irrespective of whether realistically they could seek asylum there, uh, and made asylum unavailable to people who are coming across uh, countries uh, in, in, in furtherance of their flight from their country of origin. So effectively that meant you could still seek asylum if you flew into JFK Airport right, or to Chicago and had the means to do so. But for the folks who were seeking asylum at the southern border, um, even if they weren't expelled under Title 42, and even if, and tell me when I need to be quiet because I, should I go to two? Oh, okay, sorry, I will wind down and we'll talk about more this. Yeah, okay, sorry. Even if you were able to get across the, um, uh, even if you weren't expelled, even if you were apprehended and were allowed to come to the United States and go live with a relative, uh, sometimes with an, a GPS ankle bracelet on or you were put in an immigrant prison and maybe released, even if all those things, you were able to kind of get through those hoops, then you had to contend, or your lawyer had to contend, if you were lucky enough to have one, um, with the fact that asylum was not available to you. So there was really the prize, if you will, had been taken away. That was reversed by courts. Um, thankfully, uh, the, the, the evisceration of our asylum law, you know, again, built on international principles and international treaties and shared by many nations, that piece of it uh, has been restored. Still not easy, still 25% or less, still hard to get asylum, but at least you can apply once you make it through. So I will stop there, and I thank you for indulging my um, passion a little bit about this, and look forward to taking questions after uh, Jason speaks. Thank you, Troy. Thank you um, for the invitation to the league. Appreciate being here. Again, my name is Jason Berkovich, I'm the Director of Constituent Services for Congressman Peters, and I'm also a Foreign Affairs Policy Advisor for the Congressman. Um, so what I wanna do is just give you guys kind of a bird's eye look at, at what we're dealing with in DC and how we discuss immigration and immigration reform. Um, and then I'd love to hear more questions about which topics you guys are interested in so we can dig into those in a little bit more detail. So first of all, when we're talking about immigration, it's really important to realize that Everyone actually agrees the system's broken. The right of the right of the Republican Party, the left of the left of the Democratic Party, and everything in between agrees that our immigration system is broken. In fact, 
we almost all agree on what the issues are with the immigration system itself. So everyone acknowledges we have at least 11 million undocumented here in the United States. We're going to have to figure out something to do with them. We know that we've got years and years and years of backlogs of visa applications, whether it's people that are trying to get a green card, people that are trying to come to school. I mean, it, it takes forever to get a work authorization. People acknowledge that. We've got thousands and thousands and thousands of, of applicants waiting for decisions on asylum cases and on refugees that are trying to come here to the United States. So there's agreement, basically, that it's broken and what the problems are. The issue, though, is we can't agree on how to solve it. And that's the important thing for us to keep in mind, is the disagreement is really what is the solution to these problems. And what I'm hoping to give you a better perspective about today is what we might do in order to come to a solution. So as was mentioned earlier in the presentation by Jane, when President Biden took office, of course, he introduced legislation, um, which is kind of his dream solution to what's going on with immigration. And we've seen that there are other pieces that have been introduced by Democrats as well, other, other bills, whether it's um, helping to deal with dreamers, whether it's working with essential workers. So there's a lot of proposals that are out there on the Democratic side. At, at the same time, we've seen proposals on the Republican side. So the Republicans would like to build a wall. The Republicans would like to hire additional Border Patrol staff. The Republicans would like to get more judges into the immigration courts in order to move through some of these backlogs. So we know what the Republicans want. We know what the Democrats want. How come we can't solve it? And I think that's the big issue that we have. And the reason that I would argue, and this is something the Congressman often brings up, because we've seen it, in fact, over the last couple of weeks, not with immigration, but with infrastructure. They don't talk to each other. So the Republicans think that they have the solution. The Democrats think that they have the solution, but we can't get them to talk to each other. It's very difficult to engage in a conversation with a broader group of Democrats and a broader group of Republicans because ultimately, and President Biden has actually said this time and time again, in order for us to solve the biggest problems that we have in this country, the only real solutions are bipartisan. You can't have a Democratic solution to any long-term problem, and you can't have a Republican solution to any long-term problem because each administration then flips up and back between what they think the solution is. So we're gonna have to find a way in order to bring the Democrats and the Republicans together as a group to figure out what a good compromise is. And the compromise is not gonna be what everybody wants. In fact, everyone's probably gonna be angry with some component of the compromise. But that's the nature of compromise and that's the nature of a functioning government. That's how we got a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill just passed last week through the House is we had Democrats and Republicans talking to each other in the Senate and compromising on the things that are needed in order to move this country forward. And then even in the House, we had 13 Republicans join the Democrats in passing bipartisan historical investment in the nation's infrastructure. Because again, everybody acknowledged that our infrastructure was broken. We need that same approach when it comes to immigration. We need to have some champions just sit down in a room, Democrats and Republican champions, it's gotta be from both, and hash out what they want and what they're willing to compromise on. And that's what I would like to focus on now is that's really the hardest part, I think, when it comes to immigration reform. For those of us that are strong proponents of immigration reform, for those of us that want to have a humanitarian policy to assist those that are trying to find safety, for those that are fleeing persecution, we want a policy that'll help them. We know that we have a labor shortage here in the United States. We want immigrants that are willing to work really, really hard and earn a, a, a living wage to be able to come here and fill those jobs and work in the fields up at the farms that we have where we know that they need more people. So we, there are things that we know that we want, but we also know that there are things that we're concerned about. For example, from a Democratic so Party side, there's a lot of concerns about you know, what Border Patrol does. And if we hired more Border Patrol agents, what would those Border Patrol agents do? If we had more judges, uh, the immigration courts are actually quasi-judicial. They're under the Department of Justice. They're not actually under the judiciary branch. So any attorney general could come in, as we've seen, and make changes to that. So there are concerns. But I think the big one for us is we're going to need to decide where we're willing to compromise and where we're not as a Democratic Party. And at the same time, the Republicans are going to have to decide where they're willing to compromise and where those red lines are. And once we can figure out where the areas are that everybody can compromise on, 
that's how we're going to see the little steps start to be taken to improve the broader immigration failure that we currently have, which is the policy that everyone agrees on is broken. So I'll give you some examples of where those compromises lie. Um, a few years back, it was 2013 or 2014, we saw a group of senators come together. I believe it was either six or eight of them. They came together and they came up with a comprehensive immigration reform package that they had agreed upon. Unfortunately, we never had a chance to vote for that in the House, given the partisanship. The Speaker would not allow us to take a vote. We think that that would have passed. But a lot of those senators are still around. Um, and their positions may have changed based on the politics of immigration. But we should look at that as a good baseline. So we know that both Democrats and Republicans agree that we need a faster work visa program and we need more work visas. So Republicans and Democrats all agree. In fact, labor unions and the Chamber of Commerce also agree. So it's one of the few areas where everybody seems to agree. So maybe we should look at bills that are specifically targeting the backlogs in labor applications and expanding the use of visas for people that want to come here to work. That's an area where we all know that we agree. Another one is everybody agrees that we need to improve security at our, at our borders, whether it's the southern border, whether it's in our airports, whether our northern borders. Um, some would say that security entails building a wall. Some would say that security entails hiring more staff. Some would like us to use additional technology, for example, drones, many of which are manufactured right here in San Diego. So we should acknowledge that we do need more security and security is an issue. So where can we bring better security measures? Um, we felt that the wall was really, it's a waste of money. and. We've seen that they're already climbing the wall in different areas. So where could that money be spent more effectively? You know, we can post, we've got all these high tech cameras that are available. Maybe post some additional cameras. Like I said, the drone use, we do need more staff. So what is the appropriate level of staffing? But instead of looking things in terms of black and white, border security, bad, immigration, good, let's acknowledge that yes, if we're going to come to a compromise, then we are going to need to include in that compromise certain measures that allow us to increase our security along the southern border, along the northern border, and in our airports. So we know that there's areas to focus there. The one that surprises me is, like I said, with the judges of the Department of Justice. Everybody wants the immigration courts to go faster. The Republicans would often argue that it needs to go faster so we can deport people. Democrats would often argue that it needs to go faster so we can get people an actual status instead of leaving them in limbo. So we all agree that we need more judges and we need, like, how come we can't solve that one? Like, where is the bill that specifically deals with immigration judges and nothing else? And maybe we should probably put in some guardrails there as to the powers within the attorney, that the attorney general has. But that's another one where it seems like it'd be easy to fix. Um, but again, this is where compromise is going to be required if we're going to solve this. And the other thing that I'll mention, the, the last thing that I'll mention um, with regards to policy, and I kind of brought up briefly before, though, is we have to stop talking in absolutes. So it's not open border or closed border. Um, it's not all immigrants or no immigrants. It's not all refugees or no refugees. Um, we really need to understand that there's a lot of, the, immigration is very complex and our immigration laws are very complex and that's for a reason. Um, we're starting to learn that not all Latinos are the same. So the, the story of a, of a Mexican immigrant could be very different from a Brazilian immigrant, from a Haitian immigrant. The story of all Asian Americans isn't the same. So somebody that came here post Vietnam War, Vietnamese is very different than somebody that might be coming right now from Hong Kong or somebody that's trying to f um, flee oppression in, in other countries. So let's acknowledge that there are, that it is very complex. And finally, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is the politics. Um, when it comes to the politics and the elections of this, we should actually look, and if Tom was here, him and I disagree a little bit on this. So polls are important in order to get the pulse. Um, but what we've learned over the last six years, in my opinion, is that polls aren't always an accurate pro projection anymore of where things stand because there's a lot of people out there that don't feel comfortable answering polls. So you're getting a subset of a subset of those who are actually willing to answer and then how they feel. I like to look at elections a little bit more. And when we look at elections, 2020 is a very good example. President Biden was elected with 81 million votes. President, former President Trump, though, received 74 million votes, if I remember correctly. That's a lot of votes, 74 million. Biden won the presidency. In the Senate, we saw the Democrats pick up a seats, couple seats in the Senate. Now we now have a 50-50 Senate. We won two seats in Georgia. We won a seat in Colorado. We won a seat in Arizona. 
So there were Democratic gains in the Senate. But in the House, the Democrats actually lost about 13 seats. And within those 13 seats that were lost, we lost two seats in South Florida among some of those districts with highest immigrant populations, huge number of Cubans, huge number of Venezuelans, of Colombians in South Florida. They elected Republicans to the House of Representatives. Same thing in Texas. We're talking about what's going on in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. Multiple congressional seats were flipped in Texas where Republican candidates on the border were elected. People sometimes ask, why would that be? Well, if you go to the Rio Grande Valley, it's rare that you'll run into a family that doesn't know somebody or is related to somebody that works for the Border Patrol. That's just, those are the jobs that are in the Rio Grande Valley are Border Patrol agents. So they feel for the Border Patrol agents who are right now trying to be parents, psychologists, law enforcement officers, and child care providers all at the same time. So we can see from the elections that people actually want to balance. People understand that Democrats might be good in certain positions, but they also want to balance. And that's how we should be treating our legislation. The voters have shown us that they want to balance in who's in control. We had multiple states where Biden won and then Republicans won the governor's race. Um, in Maine, Susan Collins was reelected for Senate and Biden won the state of Maine. So the voters have already shown us that they want a healthy balance between Democrats and Republicans. And we should start treating policy that way as well. We should start treating it as a healthy balance, which requires compromise in order for us to come to long-term solutions. And I'll leave you with one quote, which stands out to me. Um, it's from former Senator Ted Kennedy, who some of you may be aware, one of his best friends was Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah. So you, I don't think anybody would ever argue against Senator Kennedy's progressive values and what he stood for. And Senator Hatch was pretty much a beacon on the conservative side as well. But they were great friends. And an expression that Sen Senator Kennedy used to use, which stood out to Senator Hatch, is if somebody's offering me half the pie today, I'm going to take it. But I'm coming back tomorrow for the other half. And we need to start doing that as voters and as elected officials. If somebody's offering you something good today, take it. We can keep working on other things tomorrow, but we've got to st start to accept that no legislation is perfect. So stop sacrificing the perfect for the, stop sacrificing the good for the sake of the perfect. Let's take the pie that we can get and then we'll fight tomorrow for the rest of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. I think we're going to just sit down for the Q&A, because then Beryl and I can confab about the questions. Um, so Beryl, can you, are you ready with one? OK, Jason, um, what candidates or Congress people are interested in championing immigration reform? So that's a great question. Can everybody hear me? I think I have a pretty good voice. So <laughs> um, is this okay? Okay. So there's a lot of champions out there. And what I recommend people do is look up bills that have been introduced in the past. So for example, I know that part of the Senate negotiations that happened a few years ago regarding immigration reform, um, Senator Lindsey Graham was involved in that. Senator Mitt Romney uh, has expressed thoughts on immigration reform. Senator Susan Collins from the Republican side, we know that she's expressed um, certain sentiments about working on immigration reform. On the Democratic side, we have the Hispanic Caucus in the House. Many Latino members in the Hispanic Caucus have, of course, been champions of this, a lot of them from right here in, in California. But I would, what I would suggest, the Hispanic Caucus members tend to be the champions in the House of much of the immigration reform. Um, also, where do, on the committees, the Judiciary Committee handles a lot of immigration. So you can look at who's on the Judiciary Committee. I would say that's the easiest way to find your champions is look at who's introduced past legislation, been involved with the previous negotiations such as Senator Lindsey Graham, Mitt Romney, Susan Collins. I know on the Democratic side, Cory Booker has been involved in these conversations a bit. Um, Dick Durbin, Richard, Senator Durbin is the number two Democrat in the Senate or number three Democrat. This is a passion of his. Um, look at who's been involved in previous conversations and who's introduced those bills, and that'll actually show you who the champions are. Here in San Diego, I would argue that we have four champions at least, um, and even Congressman Issa on the Republican side has worked with us in the past. If it wasn't for Congressman Issa, we wouldn't have been able to rebuild our port of entries at San Ysidro and at Otay Mesa. So here in San Diego, there's a lot of stuff that all five members agree on when it comes to working on the border and working on immigration. 
Thank you. What a good response. Okay, Troy, for you. Um, can you comment on the quality of immigration judges in our region? And do you have any recommendations for improving immigration courts? Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, so this is uh, difficult because it's being recorded and I appear before some of these judges. <laughs> so let me take the second part of the question first. <laughs> I feel, and um, my friend here mentioned that immigration judges are technically lawyers that work for the Department of Justice. They are not what we call Article III judges. They are not federal judges that are subject to confirmation by the Senate and who have lifetime appointments or are otherwise insulated from the executive branch. The Department of Justice is the nation's prosecutor. So judges who work for the nation's prosecutor are working for the nation's prosecutor. In other words, though they are by statute supposed to be uh, independent, by affiliation, by philosophy, in many cases, they are more pro, -pro more pro prosecution. The statistics when you look at immigration judges around the country, um, I don't remember the exact percentage, but there's a huge, I want to say, majority, definitely more than 51 percent, who are former immigration prosecutors. So it is uh, it is rare to come across a judge who's had a career like I have, representing people, um, particularly from a nonprofit context. So. There have been some proposals to switch the scheme so that immigration judges no longer answer to now to the Department of Justice and, and, and will, in a sense, be like federal district court judges or maybe federal bankruptcy judges, mm -hmm. and thus be insulated from the vicissitudes of politics either direction. I've been impressed with the quality of adjudications of uh, San Diego immigration judges. I felt like uh, a lot of times their hands were tied by a number of the, for example, asylum no longer exists per the last administration. There was very little that an immigration judge could do to get around that fact. Um, like any professional corps, I think the quality is uneven. I think there's some amazing immigration judges out there, but I do feel that there is a, a, a bent toward, um, toward Deportation prosecutors. So, to follow up, is there enough staff for the judges? From my experience as an advocate, no. Uh, it's there's judges now. There's a 1.4 million back, uh, case backlog throughout the country in terms of immigration cases. Um, two years ago, it was 700,000. Um, when I started in the practice, I think it was negligible. Uh, there were enough judges. This is the, the number of cases um, has far exceeded uh, the capacity for judges who, I think, by and large, in their minds, do want to do the right thing. Well, why become a judge? You've got somebody's life in front of you. Um, but I have, the immigration judges have a union. Uh, the last administration tried to dismantle that union, but it's a strong union. I think that the staff within uh, a particular judge's chambers, if you will, um, it also varies. But I don't get the sense that it's that they don't have enough staff. It's that the judge is the one who, at the end of the day, makes the decision, sits in the courtroom, and whose decision is subject to appeal. And so really, it's, my sense is that it's, it's, the, it's the lack of judges, enough judges. And is it computerized now? If someone moves around. Yeah, sorry. Uh, great, great question. When I started this practice 20 years ago, you would have been surprised, and we had computers 20 years ago. It was not computerized. And so every filing, filings in immigration court are quite voluminous. It would be these two, three inch thick filings that you have to physically take two hours away to a detention center. Um, in the last couple of years, they have automated the system in certain immigration courts. We're blessed to have San Diego and the immigration court in El Centro. Um, moving in that direction. Uh, so it is, I would say it's partially, partially uh, digitized. Okay, here's, here's the core curtain. How many immigrants can we reasonably absorb? And can you maybe explain how businesses get technical? Uh, 
people with technical visas to come from overseas. H H one B, is that what it's called? Yep. Okay, I don't know who wants to play with that. Uh, I'd be happy to call. So, how many immigrants could we absorb? A lot, because <laughs> ultimately it's going to depend on what category they're under. If we're looking at work visa specifically, um, the H one B is available to high tech staff. Um, so there are certain requirements. There are salary requirements to qualify for an H one B. There are educational requirements to qualify for an H one B. Um, their job posting requirements to give Americans so but those are again specific to high-tech jobs there's an h2 a program which is specifically for agricultural workers so we have different categories in order to attract different types of workers we have um, a special visa uh, I believe it's the L visa which is for executives within multinational corporations so they can come visit their businesses here and monitor their businesses here you can can transfer staff from, say, the London office to the New York office to the San Diego office. So there are multiple visas for these different types of categories. One of the things that we've seen, though, over the last 20 to 25 years is, unfortunately, it used to be fairly easy to get a work visa. So people would get their work visa. They would come, for example, for the farm workers. They would come during the harvest season. They would pick the crops. They would plant the seeds, and then they would go home. And one of the reasons why, one of the reasons that many people feel we have a lot of undocumented immigrants in the United States now is because over the years it's become more and more difficult to get a work visa. So instead of those people coming, doing the job, and then going home, what they've done is they've now remained in the United States because they're concerned that if they were to go home, then they would never be able to get that visa again. So that seems like an, an easier fix then some of the other ones is if we made it easy again to get work visas, then less immigrants would feel the need to remain in the United States out of concern that they wouldn't be able to come back for the next harvest season or they wouldn't be able to come back for, say, a seasonal job over the summer or over the winter. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's any cap on that because the jobs are going to vary. Um, with regards to the H-1B, that one is a little bit contentious because some would argue that immigrants are being brought in in order to take American jobs. Um, and Congressman Peters actually introduced legislation to deal with this previously. M Democrats and Republicans all agree that it's important for us to attract the brightest, and, uh, the brightest and best from around the world. So we should have these visas that are specific to those that have a particular expertise that we might be lacking here. The issue becomes how broadly the visas have started to become used. So there are discussions about increasing the salary threshold, increasing the educational threshold, changing the job posting threshold. So that's another one where instead of looking at it black or white, do we need H-1B visas, yes or no, I think the conversation should be more, how can we reform the program in order to serve the purpose that it was originally established for, but also to help Americans get good high paying jobs add a little um, quick gloss to that. So there is definitely a distinction between skilled and unskilled labor when it comes to availability and types of visas that are available in this country. For the folks that are stranded, marooned, what I was talking about, are generally not folks who are going to qualify for H-1Bs. They're not engineers and doctors from certain countries. Um, there is no such thing as a nanny visa. There's no such thing as a gardener visa. There's no such thing as a home health care worker visa. There's no such thing as a nurse's visa anymore. For a lot of the jobs Americans don't want to do, quote unquote, there is no visa. There is no line. You know, for, why don't they just get in line? There's no line because there's no visa for the types of work for so many who are our neighbors and friends and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and fellow, fellow residents of California. So there, there are a couple of questions. Excuse me. There are a couple of questions that relate to families, families. Thank you. And family separation. Um, what's happened to the children that we've seen in cages? And also, have you worked? This is for, directed to Troy, with immigrant families that have experienced family separation. Can you comment on those? 
So um, under the last administration, there was a policy of separating families at the border that um, was um, in part addressed by the courts, but was still winding its way through the courts. Um, and it uh, is a policy that has not been continued under this administration. In fact, the only uh, exemption, if you will, to Title 42 is for unaccompanied minors, which kind of has the, the perverse effect of motivating families to separate themselves from their teenagers or younger so that the kids can go across by themselves. Um, I have not personally, I've done mostly adult work. Um, I'm working with, uh, you know, on the other side of the border right now, a lot of families who, under the last administration, would have been subject to family separation, who are mostly from Central America, um, and who are now, through other means, blocked from even getting that far, if you will. Um, but I guess the question also had to do with sort of what, what, what those families go through, or what you probably have heard in the news, there was a, apparently an idea to compensate those families. Um, there's been certainly an effort, and I think it's, we're talking about 2,500 families, um, the last time I saw the statistic, who were separated and some of the parents were, many of the parents were deported, sent back to presumably to their countries, and then the kids became unaccompanied minors. Um, so there's kind of a attempt to um, repair the damage from, from that kind of horrible period. Uh, I can tell you that I've worked in detention centers where kids um, as young as three and four years old uh, you know, walk around with concertina wire, barbed wire. Uh, there's target practice that the guards, these ICE guards have, and you just can't believe that little kids are in these types of prisons. So it, it, is, it is a problem. I think it's, it's less of a problem, but with sort of different, maybe a different manifestation um, under this administration. Can I add a note on that one? Sure. Um, so I would just add a note, too, because I think there's a lot of misinformation and confusion out there, particularly about this topic. Um, so one, it's important to acknowledge the courts ruled that the previous administration broke the law. So this isn't just something that Biden came up with. The courts, our judges, many of which were appointed under the Trump administration, have ruled that the Trump administration broke the law. The Justice Department now is trying to settle with the families that the courts ruled they were separated through breaking the law. It was illegal to separate those families. The courts decided that. The Justice Department is now working on a settlement because of what the previous administration did. So there's a lot of misinformation out there about the current administration trying to pay off a bunch of immigrants as opposed to supporting American families. The current administration is trying to settle a legal case because the previous administration broke the law. So that's the first thing. The other thing that I would note, and this is a good example, is it's a lot easier to tear something down than it is to build it up. And for those of us um, that consider ourselves immigration proponents, we need to realize that there was a lot of damage that was done over four years. That damage was pretty easy. Us fixing it takes a lot longer than, let's see, we've had eight months so far under President Biden. So it would behoove immigrant proponents to be a little bit more patient and understand that it takes a lot of work to fix four years of damage. And this court case and the family separations is a perfect example of how hard it is and how long it takes to fix something that was done so easily. Okay, I have a question. I'm going to expand on it though. When someone gets through their credible fear interview and they're allowed into the United States, they're not in, in detention, they're with their sponsor, what uh, US services are they eligible for? What are they eligible to do, like work? Uh, and then when they become a permanent legal uh, resident, does that change? I'll let you cover the legal sure. <laughs> So um, thanks for the question. So a credible fear interview, just in case you may not have heard the term, is the initial interview that happens often at the border, sometimes later now, to allow you to get a foot in the door and you have to make kind of a minimum showing that you have a, a well-founded of persecution on one of the five grounds that I mentioned before. Um, but the thrust of the question is, uh, what benefits are folks who are 
asylum seekers entitled to, and the answer is very few, next to none. Um, asylum, asylum seekers, though it's technically a status, it's not a status that would qualify anybody for welfare, for example, for food stamps, for example. A little bit more with Medi-Cal in California, because it's California, but generally in the rest of the country, no Medicaid, uh, which is Medi-Cal. Uh, asylum seekers are often left to fend for themselves. Nonprofits, churches, and others um, help them and have tried to help them um, over the years, but it is, uh, unlike in, in some other Western countries, uh, there is not a, a, a federal benefit or temporary stipend or housing allowance or case management for asylum seekers in this country. With respect to work, um, asylum seekers have the right to apply for a work permit, after, to receive a work permit after, they had the right to apply and receive a work permit after six months of having their case pending. The prior administration changed that to 365 days. So now um, an asylum seeker who files her asylum application, I just did one of these this week, she will need to wait a year and the thought is that it basically deprives the person. I, I assume the thought is it's a deterrent, right, from people who want to come here and work for six months or something while their asylum case is pending. It is, a, it is in effect, um, a deprivation of the ability to work lawfully in this country while your asylum case is pending. Um, there's been some class actions trying to challenge that, uh, but basically the, the, the basic scenario is it's now you need to wait a year. And of course, the, the hope is that I think the administrative and bureaucratic hope is that your case will be disposed of by that. Either you'll have been granted asylum or you'll have been granted, uh, or you'll have been deported. And I'll add one other note on asylum too, which is important, because again, these are facts, and you can find this information because it's publicly available. Asylum seekers are two to three times more likely to show up to court than American is. I'll repeat that. An asylum seeker is two to three times more likely to show up to court than an American is. Why is that? It's the only way they can gain legal status. If they don't go in front of the judge, they have no way to gain legal status. So another misnomer that's out there in the immigration conversation is that the asylum seekers go through their credible fear interview and then they disappear into the United States and never come back. And it's just not true. Remember, asylum seekers are two to three times more likely than an American to show up to court. But Troy, you, I think you mentioned that MPP is really back. But is it? I thought it was being negotiated with Mexico. Back or bad? Back. Back. Sure. As, as far I have no inside information, maybe you do on this. Um, the, basically, as I understand it, is that NPP was discontinued in a, in a sort of uh, informal way in March. And President Biden gave Secretary Mayorkas um, a number of months to actually um, come up with a memo that would discontinue it. When that memo came out, uh, allegedly that memo didn't follow the procedures and the protocols, notice and comment period that we um, had in this country for very good reason um, for new regulations. And so when it was challenged by, I believe it was the governor of Texas and the governor of Arkansas, uh, it was largely on procedural grounds. Wait, you didn't give the American people a chance to the 60 days to, to comment on this before you rescinded it. So what um, Mayorkas then did was issued, and I just read it the other day, another memo, very explicitly kind of going through, uh, elaborating his reasons for discontinuing the program, many of which were, it's not in the nation's national security interest, basically. It's not, it's diverting resources from border patrol, it's diverting when we have all of these um, uh, tent courts set up and additional judges and things like that. <clears throat> it was not serving the interests of the United States. It wasn't consistent with our interests in reducing push, the push factors from places like Guatemala and Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador that cause people to come here. Corruption, crime, environmental damage. In fact, it, it basically well, it was not uh, serving the ostensible purposes that it was implemented to serve. So this longer memo then was published and, or, or put out there. Uh, and I believe the attorneys for the, uh, the, the governors in, in Texas and Arkansas then went back and some arguments before that court or a court above it in Texas, uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals basically argued, well, this is not good enough either. And we're waiting to see if the appellate court judge is going to vacate the trial court's injunction at this point. 
So I hope that wasn't hyper technical, but it is kind of a interplay between the uh, what the administrative branch is trying to do, and it's very excuse me, the executive branch is very upfront with this is a bad program. We wanted to continue it, but we're going to follow the law because we do. We're going to follow what the judge says we have to do because that's who we are. But we're also going to work to try to convince people it should be taken down. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Uh, all good questions. So um, I'm going to try to combine two. Um, what can there be, can anything be done on a federal level to mitigate the increase in immigrants, such as providing foreign aid to countries of origin? And um, what role do you feel think Kamala Harris has been playing in immigration reform? So. With regards to Kamala Harris and what role is she playing, she's the one that's out negotiating with other countries um, about what potential changes we can make to U.S. relationships with those countries, as well as immigration policies in which, for example, as Troy brought up earlier and was part of the slide, people potentially being able to start an asylum process or a refugee process within their home country before making the trek to the United States. So she's largely the one that's out there trying to negotiate potential changes to policies. Um, that way people can start the process in their home country before they come in up here. And also changes that other governments might make so people aren't as eager or don't need to migrate as much. Um, we know climate change is a major issue that's driving migration these days. Drought is resulting in food shortages. Hurricanes are resulting in flooding. If you can't eat and you can't live in a house, you're probably not gonna to wanna to stick around very long. So that's one area where we're looking to work with other countries in order to reduce the impacts of climate change. Um, corruption, we know that corruption is an issue. We wanna make sure that when we're providing US aid to other countries that that aid is going for the purposes that it's intended to help the people, to help the economy, to build a better atmosphere for, for investment, for job growth. Um, so yes, yeah, so she is largely on the front lines negotiating with other countries using those diplomatic channels for them to make the changes that they need to make so people are less less likely to need to migrate feel less likely they're less likely to feel threatened, um, less likely to be in search of a job or a safe haven to live in and also at the same time to see how we can better use our consulates um, within the immigration process. Okay, well, I want to thank you both. You've been so, so great participants here. And we do have a uh, League of Women Voters mug for each of oh, you as a thank, thank, you. thank you gift. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for coming. This will be uh, the videotape, our wonderful videographer. Jane, can will I add be one? posted on our website. Can I add one soon. quick note, actually? Absolutely. So I'll, I just wanted to add one quick thing because I forgot to address this reconciliation. So oh, yeah. reconciliation is actually budget reconciliation. Reconciliation is the short term. So it's budget reconciliation. In regards to, because I thought it might come up with one of the questions. In regards to the conversation about immigration reform in the context of budget reconciliation, we should understand that it is very difficult for one primary reason. Congress does not allocate any money to US citizenship and immigration services. US Citizenship and Immigration Services operate solely on the fees that they collect through applications. So there is no budgetary impact from a federal government perspective from the immigration process. People pay to file for a green card. They pay to file for a work permit. That's what makes the, the agency function. So although various proposals have come forward to see if the parliamentary parliamentarian will allow it, it is very difficult because no federal money currently goes to the agency that's in charge of immigration. Mm -hmm. Wait, it, that no money goes to... Department no federal of, money goes to U.S. DHS. citizenship, USCIS, U.S. Okay. Citizenship and Immigration Services, which adjudicates all the applications for anybody who's an immigrant. No federal funding goes to U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. But it does go to DHS, right? It does, but DHS in itself doesn't adjudicate immigration benefits. USCIS does. So none of DHS's funding from a federal budgetary perspective 
goes towards the adjudication of immigration benefits. Okay. I just wanted to add that I have an email list of about over 200 people. But if you want to be added to it, to get uh, uh, notices about our activities or the notes from our events, please come up here and give me your email address. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. A great discussion. Thank you. Glad to be here.